Um, a frequent piece of advice I hear uh, on giving presentations as a physics student, like over and over again, is take it easy on the equations. And you just know when someone begins their talk with that opening line that there's going to be an equation just right around the corner waiting for you. But um, I'm just going to avoid the mathematical nitty gritty of this and look at what this equation that I'm going to show you represents uh, in a bigger picture, what it represents. So if everyone's ready, this <laughs> is what is known as the standard model Lagrangian. And in this elegant little formalism is encoded the sum total of our knowledge in particle physics today. So all the constituents of matter, all the forces between them, um, so me, you, and just about everything that's visible in this universe is more or less described by this equation we have here. But that turns out to be a problem because scientists have been looking out at the universe for decades now. And what they've noticed is it's what we don't see in the universe that makes up most of it. So if I'm being specific, 95%. 95% of our universe is made out of stuff called dark matter and dark energy. And these turn out to be just labels for stuff we know next to nothing about. However, in the context of this talk, this turns out to be the good news. Because if we take human history um, and we unroll it out like a carpet stretching back millennia, and we just, just stare at it for just a little bit, a pattern begins to emerge. So, what we have are vast holes in our knowledge being occasionally illuminated by some fundamental insight into how the physical world operates. And invariably, leading from these fundamental insights are, are threads, tangled and circuitous and maybe, to the many technologies that we enjoy today. Um, for a brief and off-quoted example, we can look at GPS navigation systems and general relativity. Now, General relativity, if people know, um, it was postulated by Einstein, and it is a description of how space and time just bend in the presence of massive objects. And what we have beneath our very feet right here is a pretty massive object known as the Earth. So when GPS satellites are orbiting 20,000 kilometers in the air, space-time bends just a little bit less at that height versus down here on Earth. And this manifests itself in the equations that need to, uh, that take place in GPS systems. So if GPS systems did not take general relativity into account, the calculations per day would be off by 10 kilometers. Now, this is just one example of this, this link between physical theory and technology. But um, the interesting thing we can do with this pattern is to take it and extrapolate it to the near future. So, um, I'm just going to go through two examples today, because if not, I'd be here all day talking about physics. But um, the, this interplay, this intellectual ballet that's been going on, is something that's been going on for a long time, and it's still going on in every facet of our search for knowledge right now. To start off, let's go to fusion and nuclear theory. Now, fusion is a bit of a strange case, because it's been implied by nuclear theory, since the start of the field. Um, and it's just been in the implementation that's been a bit finicky. And I'll get to that later. But in the 1920s, um, nuclear theory started. And that's when we began to realize that atoms really aren't the end all be all. What we have in the atoms are smaller pieces, electrons, protons, neutrons. And almost immediately, physicists being physicists, uh, they began to realize if you take a really large atom, hit it with something small. One, it'll break up into smaller pieces, but two, it'll give a lot of energy out. Uh, this process, known as fission, is what gives Ontario more than 50% of its power. Uh, nuclear reactors, more than 50%. But as I was saying, fusion is also a natural consequence of this. You can take two small atoms, um, say different types of hydrogen, fuse them together, and they make a bigger atom, but they also give a lot of energy. The reasons why this process is appealing are many. For example, we can take a look at energy density. Uh, the amount of energy given out by fusion turns out to be 10 times the amount given by fission and orders of magnitude larger than any other conventional fields. In terms of how much uh, 
the, the fuels that we need. We have tritium and deuterium types of hydrogen easily available in seawater, in lithium deposits, and there's enough to last us for tens of thousands of years. And whenever someone brings up nuclear power, there's always the question of nuclear waste. There's this um, factoid going around in the nuclear industry about nuclear power. So if fusion, or if, sorry, if fission was the only sole uh, source of power for us, in one year per person, we would generate uh, about one cup of nuclear waste. Now, if we switch to fusion, in one year for one person, you'd need, firstly, a very tiny cup, because there's very low level nuclear waste produced and a little amount, but we'd also need balloons, because the main uh, waste product of fusion is helium. Uh, so, there are many, many different companies trying to make this happen just because this is a, p a possibility for providing fusion, uh, energy for the future, cleanly and abundantly. And they all, the, the main state of all their technologies, it all sounds like mad scientist technology. You have uh, magnetic fields turning vortices of super hot plasma. You have the world's biggest lasers being trained on one tiny uh, pellet of fuel to make fusion conditions happen. And though these companies have made vast progress over the past few decades in this technology, we're just not there yet. And before I get into that, I want to talk about quantum physics and quantum computing, a topic I'm sure everyone here is intimately familiar with. No? OK. If not, if, it, if your quantum mechanics is feeling rusty, let me just give you a brief overview. So in the 1900s, our understanding of reality began to change. It became clear that at the smallest levels, atomic um, and, and even smaller, that a lot of properties that we take for granted in this large scale world just don't make sense. There's a lack of certainty there. Um, speed, position, all of these become concepts that are really fuzzy at the smallest levels. So say you have an electron. You can say an electron exists at a given point with a certain probability, but with no real certainty. And now this lack of definiteness may sound a bit scary. And in a sense, it does undermine the very foundations of what our senses say is true. But it also seems to be hard coded into what reality really is. And over the years, we began to manipulate this to our advantage. If you have any electronic devices on you right now, uh, the semiconductor devices, the transistors in your electronic devices only work due to quantum mechanical principles where electrons behave both as a wave and as a particle. But what we, uh, we've used this quantum mechanical principles in electronics for a long time now. What we haven't used it for is information processing. In the 1980s, Richard Feynman, who is one of the most eminent theoretical physicists of the modern times, proposed the idea of a quantum computer. Now, a classical computer is something that runs on bits. You have zeros and ones representing information, and this is acted upon to process whatever information you want. Now, if you have a quantum computer, um, you'd have a quantum bit or a qubit, which also is in a state of zero or one, or it can be using quantum strangeness or weirdness, you can put it in a state of being both a zero and a one at the same time. Now, this is kind of hard to digest, so let's look at a toy model of qu quantum computing, or computing in general. So let's say, okay, we have a classical computer and we have a quantum computer. Let's give them four bits, so four pieces of information. But instead of zeros and ones, let's say that they can be A's or B's. Now, the classical computer would be in one of these states. So let's just pick one at random, let's say, it can be in state A, 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 B. Now, the quantum computer is in all the possible states of the set once. So if you have four bits, you'll have 16 different combinations. And in a weird way, it'll be in all of these states at once. If you want to ask a question to these computers, what you do is um, the classical computer, when trying to search for the answer, would change the first letter and check the answer change another letter, check if that's the answer. Now, the quantum computer, if you just manipulate it just right and ask the question in a way it can understand, it'll be able to check all these combinations at the same time. 
Now, let's say your question for these computers is, who are the Swedish pop group formed in 1972 who had the hit song Dancing Queen? And your classical computer just bumping around, trying all the different combinations. Your quantum computer goes, oh yeah, it's, it's ABBA. It's obviously ABBA. <laughs> so this is a bit of an oversimplification because the hardest part about quantum computing is asking these questions. The, you, you find out that you can't really phrase the questions these way, uh, this way to some of these computers. And some of the problems it can actually solve are like, optimization problems. Optimization problems are problems like you want to get from point A in a city to point B, you're given, and you want to find the shortest route. Um, but given these driving conditions, given these stops for gas, so how do you solve that? A lot of e uh, problems like this crop up everywhere. And using a technique called quantum annealing, it's found out that a quantum computer would be able to solve 